Hey. Hey. <laughs> we're, we're here. We're here, yes. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Sonoma Couture Presents, our first ever live streaming event. We're so excited to host this today. And mm. it's all about bringing the basics of winemaking and food and wine pairing and making wine fun. And who better to do this than John Ash? <sighs> <laughs> so I just wanted to say a few things about John Ash to introduce, oh sorry, I'm Kara Morrison, I'm the Chardonnay winemaker here at Sonoma Couture, I've been here about 10 years looking after the Chardonnay, so thank you all for enjoying the Chardonnay, I'm so thankful that you're all part of the club, um, and, uh, and I get to make this wonderful Chardonnay for you. Um, so John Ash, he is, well he's just an, kind of an icon in Sonoma County, and in the culinary world. Um, since 1980, he opened his own namesake restaurant here in Sonoma County. And about the same time, he started working with Sonoma Couture, working on food and wine pairings and, and other th stuff for us, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Correct, yeah. 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 Um, he's been on the Food Network, Culinary Institute, <coughs> teacher, one of the best teachers named, what was that? The, the uh, It's called the IACP, the International Association of Culinary professionals. Not that anybody would know what that is. <laughs> but it's nice to be recognized by your peers. That, yes, absolutely. That, that, that you, you, you can teach. Yes. You know, that kind of stuff. That's great. <laughs> and speaking of being recognized, he's written four cookbooks, and he's gotten two James Beard Awards, which are like the Oscars of the culinary world. And, well, so much more. Yeah. So, and he's got one more book coming out this spring. That's so right. So look right. for that. Yeah. And anything else? No, nope, that's, okay. that's, that's plenty, because it's all about me. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so anyway, I hope everybody enjoys this first presentation. Thanks, Kara. Thank you. Thanks, that's great. So we took her, took her away from all of her winemaking duties to come in here and do this, which is really good. So what we're going to do today is, we, when we talked about doing this, we thought, so what? Uh, hopefully this will be the first of many to come with many characters, not just me up here. Uh, but to talk a little bit about so, uh, about kind of the basics of wine. So this is kind of wine 101, I guess, a little bit. So a lot of this stuff you already know. But I, I, um, I often find that sometimes it's a good idea to kind of review these things because it, sometimes we only have a piece of the, uh, a piece of the information. So I'm going to just kind of blast. Through. I have some notes here that I'm going to refer to. Uh, yeah, just to keep me on track also so that I'm not wandering off someplace. So uh, wine, I think you all know, we, we got these today. It doesn't illustrate it very well, but, you know, wine has been around uh, with mankind since before uh, recorded history. And I think the reason for it is, you know, if you look very closely, these are, these are still pretty young. They're not ready to be picked yet. But if you look very closely at them, you can see that there's a kind of white dusting on the outside of the... The grapes, well, that's mostly yeast. And so probably how man discovered wine was some of these grapes got crushed or cut or something like that, and they immediately began to turn to wine because they couldn't help themselves because that's, that's the deal with it. So it's, a, it's an important kind of uh, consideration. The first wine book, serious wine book, that I ever got was written by uh, a guy named Leon Adams, and it was called The Common Sense Book of Wines. It must be... 45 years old now. You can still get it. If you don't have it, I would suggest that you go to Amazon or someplace. I'm sure there are used copies that are around. It's still every bit as good as any book that I've ever read on what wine is all about. And I, I want to read you something that he said in there because it made such an impression on me when I was a very young man and didn't know anything about wine at all. He said, uh, wine is the only beverage that offers a complete range of the five taste elements to which the human palate is sensitive. Sweetness, acidity, saltiness, pepperiness, and bitterness. To balance these same uh, flavor elements in solid foods. It supplies aroma, it supplies acidity, smoothness to foods that lack those qualities. It accents food flavors, and here's the part that I really liked because it appealed to my cooking instincts. Uh, it fulfills the function of a sauce. Uh, it is the sauce that you drink. So isn't that, right. isn't that an, interesting, an interesting way of thinking about it? Uh, and you all know that wine, I mean, there, there are more than 190 references to wine in the Bible. So there must be, that must make it good. That must be some sort of uh, something that, that kind of helps with that. 
And uh, I love what Ben Franklin said about wine. Uh, he said that uh, wine is sure proof that God loves you and wants you to be happy. Uh, <laughs> so so he, was, he was kind of on to things. So I'm going to start by talking about, which I find fascinating. Actually, I had to go back and look to find out what that was about. Is Why are there all these different shapes of wine bottles? Where did that come from? Mostly it came from uh, tradition, you know, because uh, originally uh, wines came from very specific areas in Europe. And so the, there was the Hock bottle, the thing that you find in Germany that went with Rieslings and all of that stuff. In Bordeaux, they had this kind of tall, high-shouldered bottle uh, that was there. And of course, in Burgundy, they had the slope-shouldered bottle. I always, I can't, I need to be careful and not go too deeply into this, but there is a male and female kind of correlation here. There is a gender consideration. Uh, one of the ways I always think about it is that Bordeaux, big red wines, you have big Cabernets and all this stuff, they're very male. They walk into the room and they just sort of <laughs> drop everything and here I am, uh, you know, see what I'm doing. With, uh, with uh, Burgundy, they're much more, they reveal themselves much more slowly. They're much more feminine. You have to talk to them. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, you have to, I don't know, you have to try to make, get them on your side and all that stuff. They do reveal themselves more slowly. So next time you're drinking either one of these, something that comes in a Bordeaux bottle or a, uh, a Burgundy bottle, you can think about the gender identification of these two things. So here's what I found which I thought was really interesting. So it was tradition, actually, these bottles, because of the places they came from. But it was economically driven. So the reason that you have this tall, skinny, uh, not as heavy, the glasses and as heavy uh, bottle that came from Germany called a Hock bottle, was uh, most of the transportation of wine in that part of the world was done on boats on the Rhine River and the other rivers of Germany. And so it was a gentle kind of transportation of those things. So what they were looking for was a bottle that didn't take up so much room that they could put, uh, put on the boat, uh, get it there. It didn't need to be heavy because it's not going to be bounced around and all of that kind of stuff. And so that was the evolution of this. So it was purely economic. This guy, these two guys, much heavier. Uh, and the reason for that was that uh, they traveled in a, a number of different ways. They weren't just gently being uh, transported around on a boat, but they were in wagons and all of that kind of stuff, so they had to be much more solid. And the reason of, for these two uh, slope shoulders, I talked to a guy from Bordeaux about this, and he said, well, the reason that the Bordeaux bottle has these high shoulders that are up here is the, that it was a place for sediment to catch in there, because if you think about Cabernet and Merlot and those things, they had much higher in tannins, and so they throw more sediment. So this was a place to catch that. If you think about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, the whole Pinot family, but especially on the, the red side, uh, they don't throw so much sediment. So it wasn't necessary to have a place for that to, uh, to catch. And then this thing, the punt, you know, the thing in the bottom of the bottle, uh, I always wonder, I thought, well, it just made it cool in restaurants, you know, to be able to pour and do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Well, it, it serves another purpose. It is, it is, especially with red wines, a place to catch sediment. But it was also there to strengthen the bottle. Again, it was all about the strength of the bottle. So by putting that punt in there, it gave it even more strength and prevented uh, uh, breakage and all of that stuff. So I found that, uh, I found that pretty fun. Um, subject that I want to cover, because it comes up all the time, I teach over at the Culinary Institute of America in their wine studies program to professionals and to, and to just folks, people who aren't professionals. And one of the, the question that I'm asked the most often, or the area that I'm asked the most often about, is this whole idea of serving wine and all of the rituals that go into serving wine and that, that, kind, of, the, that kind of thing. Uh, and the, the number one uh, thing that comes up is temperature. At what temperature should I serve wine? And in America, I will tell you, we serve red wines too warm, we serve white wines too cold. So the ideal temperature to serve a red wine is about you know, 76, 78 degrees or something like that. If you think about a day like today, pretty warm outside, certainly much more than 76 degrees, and we're outside enjoying a glass of red wine, it's like, oh, it's gonna get too hot. And what happens, you can picture it, you can, you can almost see it happening. What happens is when the wine gets over 78, up to 80, 
uh, the alcohol in the wine begins to volatilize. And what it does is you can almost kind of see it rising off there. What you get are kind of funny flavors. Uh, it, it unbalances the wine. It doesn't, it, doesn't make it, it doesn't make it more attractive to do that. So one of the things I tell people is that it's perfectly acceptable if you live in a hot climate or it's a hot day or something and you're going to enjoy a, a red wine, to stick that wine in the fridge for 15 or 20 minutes before you open it and pour it. And if, you, if you're not killing the bottle at that moment uh, and it's still 90 degrees outside, then put it back in there for another 10 minutes or so before you enjoy the second glass from it. White wines, we drink way too cold. So what's the temperature of our refrigerators at home? Most of them today are about 34 degrees, 34, 35 degrees. So if you take a bottle of wine out of the fridge and serve it up, it's going to be really chilled. Uh, you want to let it uh, uh, come up in temperature. And kind of the ideal temperature for white wine is in that 50 degree area, 50 to 55, which is much warmer than we would think. I will share, so being a restaurant guy for so many years, I'll share with you. It doesn't happen so much today because uh, there's a lot of good wine around, so there's no reason to try to, uh, try to get schlucky wine, you know, try to get it off onto people. But it used to be, it wasn't me, but it used to be uh, <laughs> that unscrupulous restaurant people, huh, what they would do is when they had, you know, just a few wines by the glass, maybe the wine by the glass, the white wine by the glass that they were offering was god-awful in its flavors and all of that stuff. All you had to do was to get it really, really cold, and you can't taste any of that. And make sure that the guest drinks it while it's still cold uh, before it begins to warm up and all of the flaws begin to present themselves. And so that was a tactic that was used. Uh, so you could buy cheap, not very good wine, but serve it cold, and people were happy to, to do that. So it is that whole idea of letting it, uh, letting it warm up a, a, a little bit, which is, uh, which is in, important. Uh, one of the old saws that we all live with, especially with red wines, is to let the wine breathe, huh? You've all heard that. And it, what's always come to my mind is, oh, I can actually see it's little lungs there, you know, after opening the bottle and letting, and it's a, there is some validity to this, but opening a bottle of red wine and letting it sit out for an hour or two doesn't do very much at all, because here's this tiny little hole that's there, uh, so the oxygen in the air is only touching a, a tiny amount of the wine. The most important thing you can do is to take the wine and really, and I saw you say it, is to aerate it and really do it. And one of the things that we found, and so this is a challenge to all of you, is to really aerate it. You can get one of these fancy schmancy little, uh, you know, Venturi things and pour it through, and they're perfectly fine. They help. But I think just to get two carafes, two old coffee cans, anything that you have, and just take the wine and back and forth, even for a minute or two, you will be amazed. It doesn't matter whether it's red wine or white wine. You'll be amazed at how much the wine has improved. Uh, and if you don't believe me, so when you're home this afternoon, I want you to get a bottle of wine, huh, open it up, pour a glass, one that you haven't done anything with, and with the rest of the wine, really abuse it. Really back and forth, and then pour a glass of that. I can almost guarantee you the one that you abused, you are going to love many times more than the one that you didn't abuse. I think there was this idea that if we weren't kind to the wine, we might hurt it somehow or something like that. And that's not true. In fact, a lot of restaurants today, uh, more and more this is happening in their wine programs. If you order a bottle of wine, they will actually decant it and take it back and forth. One of the tricks that sommeliers use and I know this, this is really heretical, uh, but especially if you have a young tannic red wine, you know, pretty puckery and all of that stuff, they actually put the damn thing in a blender and give it a few blasts of that before they serve it to you. And again, it's this whole idea of bringing out the flavors and things that are obscured uh, when they aren't there. So next time you order a bottle of wine, if you hear a blender running, you know they're back there, they're, they're back there uh, uh, doing things. So the breathing thing is, you know, that little opening of it doesn't really do much. Be aggressive. The only time you wouldn't want to do that is if you had a fragile old wine that, you know, you've had around for 25 years or something. Because often when you open those, they have a very short life uh, in between opening and 
when they begin to tail off in the glass. So don't, you wouldn't do it with that. But almost every other wine, just do it. It's the, it's the most interesting thing in the world. Um, one of the things I also want to talk a little bit about, because it's a question I get a lot about, are the shapes of wine glasses. And if you're going to buy glasses and all of that stuff, uh, what should I buy? Shapes of wine glasses can be really important. And I have nothing to do with the Riedel company, but I think all of you know, uh, so I'm being perfectly transparent here with you. Uh, but they did an amazing thing. I will tell you, the first time I went through the Riedel experience, do all of you know Riedel? Everybody knows who they are? So they're a very wonderful uh, maker of, of stemware for, for enjoying wine. And I remember the first time, this was probably 20 years ago, they do their little presentations, and you can, you can see them around. And I was the most skeptical person in the world because they presented this idea that each wine uh, benefits by having a specific glass design for it. And I thought, just drink it, you know. Just, <laughs> why, you know why, why do that? And obviously what they were trying to do, which is very smart on their side, was to sell you more wine glasses. Oh, I'm having Chardonnay tonight. I have to bring out my Chardonnay glasses. Or having Pinot Noir, I have to bring out my Pinot Noir glasses. Um, but it made, I was just blown out. It made all the difference in the world. And the whole theory there, and I won't go deeply into it, is the shape of the glass, and when you would put it back, the way that uh, the wine was presented to your nose, this being the most important organ of taste, uh, the place that it hit on your tongue or, or further back in your mouth because of the shape of the glass, would make all the difference in the world. And so if you've never done it, uh, you might uh, go after one of those things. The problem with it, of course, is none of us wants to have 18 sets of glasses for all of the <laughs> different varietals that we're going to drink. And so what it comes down to, I think, is finding a, what is called, Riedel wouldn't uh, cop to this, but it's finding an all-purpose glass, a glass that, OK, I have a nice set of glasses. They feel good, all of that stuff. This is what I'm going to use. And, uh, that's what I'm going to drink with. And the one that most people kind of come down to today is some, somewhere in between, and it just depends upon what you like, somewhere in between. Uh, these are both Riedel glasses. So this is the Chardonnay glass, and this is the uh, Cabernet glass. Obviously, difference in size. So I guess it depends on how much you drink. Uh, each, each moment. Uh, so if you drink a lot, then get the big glass. And if you don't drink so much, get the smaller <laughs> glass if you're not kind of slamming it down. Uh, but they both, they, they both work. You won't get that final uh, little thing that really does happen when they're presented. The other things that I want to say to you are uh, they've mostly gone away, but they're still out there. But for goodness sakes, don't buy cheap glasses. Uh, when, and when I say cheap glasses, those are the glasses that we still encounter in restaurants, which just drives me crazy. They have that little rolled edge on the edge of the glass, you know, which really does interfere with enjoying the, getting the wine into your mouth and enjoying. Plus, it feels funny and all of that stuff. In fact, I'm going to ask you all right now to raise your right hands. Just do it. Just humor me, okay? And repeat after me, okay? Uh, from this day forward. I will not use, will not use or, associate or associate with anyone who uses a wine glass with a rolled edge. Okay, okay. So if you encounter those things, if you walk into a restaurant and that's what they're using, you leave. Uh, if you go over to a friend's house and they're serving you wine out of those glasses, you say, "I got to go home." You know, that's uh, <laughs> that, that, that's the so that's that's the biggest thing. The other thing that is obviously true, and it's like for any of you who are cooks, you know this too. It's like one the most important tool that a cook has is a knife. And the knife needs to feel balanced. It needs to feel it's not heavier on one end or the other. So the important thing to remember is that it should be a decent base on there so that it's not going to be knocked over easily. And it should just feel good in your hand. You know, when people ask me, knives are a great example. Well, what kind of a knife should I buy? It's like, no, it's not the brand, but how does it feel in your hand? Where's the balance with that? And it's the same thing with wine glasses, too, uh, which is really important. So uh, get one that has a decent base. I, I think Riedel does a great job because you look at, the, here's this big glass, but it's got this big base, so it's going to be difficult to knock it over. Uh, and that's, that's probably a good thing. So is this interesting to all of you? Yes. Yeah, you're finding this? OK. OK, so I don't know how much time we have, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going here. Uh, subject of corked wine. Do you all know corked wines? Yeah. Uh, you know what that is? Uh, corked wines are 
So when you make a cork, a cork finished wine, uh, Sonoma Contrera has several of their wines are cork finished and some are screw cap finished. Cork blinds are those, uh, uh, cork is a natural product. It comes from the cork tree. Uh, and uh, the unfortunate, the problem is that uh, cork trees only grow in Spain and Portugal. And the world is drinking a lot more wine now than it used to drink. And so there's a, a lack of good cork out there. So there's this, there's been for the last actually 20 years, a real search to find uh, other ways of closing up the wine bottle. And the corkiness, this idea, this term cork, comes from uh, when the corks are punched out of the, out of the bark of the, the cork tree, uh, they're washed to clean them up, and then often they're put in a bleaching, mild bleaching solution to kill any, you know, little things that might be growing in there and all of that stuff. And sometimes that bleach cleaning uh, can create a, a condition called TCA which stands for trichloroanisole. And what it does is when it is present in the cork and that cork comes in contact with the wine, it actually ends up giving the wine, and you've all experienced it whether you knew it or not, uh, it gives the wine, and you can have a little bit of it or you can have a lot of it, and that's really obvious, but it gives the wine a kind of newspapery, murky uh, kind of flavor. And often it'll be in, in small quantities and you'll taste wine and say, oh, I don't like this wine. When in fact the wine was perfectly good, the winemaker did a great job of making the wine, but unfortunately put it in a bottle with a flawed cork. And so that does that. And it was, it's gotten better because there, there are some other alternatives now for finishing, for closing the bottle. But Wine Spectator, I think it was as recent a time as about five years ago, their estimate was, and I don't know where they got this number, but their estimate was that maybe 5% of all wines that are finished with a cork uh, have some degree of corkiness in them. So that's a lot, and especially if you've spent a lot of money on a good bottle of wine and you take it home and it has this kind of corky thing to it, it uh, you know, it's not a good thing. Uh, that's not a good thing to have. So the whole idea then was to find alternatives to this, to tr try and get away from dealing with this TCA problem. One of the ones that was out there, and this isn't the actual one, but it illustrates Somebody actually, and there are a few wineries that are using it, unfortunately it's really expensive, is a glass stopper in, the, in there, which is really great because glass is inert and all of that stuff, so there's not a problem. Uh, but the problem with it is it makes the package very expensive. And of course, the, the one that most people have settled on now is the screw cap, which I think you're all familiar with. When the screw cap finally hit the mar it began to hit the market in a big way, there was a lot of pushback against it, especially among serious wine people, because they said, oh, the cork, it, that's, I mean, the screw cap, that's for cheap jug wine and all that stuff. It's not for my uh, delicious, uh, wonderful wines that are very special to me and all of that kind of stuff. So it had an image problem. But as it turns out, it's probably the best closure that exists on the market. Uh, because what happened was the science of how to make these things became very much more developed. I have a little chart here. Uh, this is kind of the, and this is not to, it's, it's, it's one of the people who manufactures these things. What the winemaker can do now is that they can have uh, a, a screw cap made that allows zero oxygen into it all the way up to allowing quite a lot of oxygen into it. The rationale was letting, and this was the rationale for the cork, was that we wanted a little bit of oxygen transfer there because that would help, uh, that would help the wine to age. And this was especially true for red wine. And the concern was that with the screw cap, it made it so impervious to any oxygen getting in there that uh, wines wouldn't age properly. So it was really the Aussies and the Kiwis who pushed the, pushed the, 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 Push this whole thing out there. And in the Clare Valley and in, uh, in Australia and Marlboro in New Zealand, most of the winemakers in those two growing regions came together and said, we're going to make the commitment to do all of our wines, all of our wines, both white and red, in screw cap. We're going to make the point that this is the best closure that uh, is out there. And so they did. And it was because of their efforts then, grudgingly in America, we also began to uh, use the screw cap more and more. And I think all of us as consumers, certainly as I get older 
and I have um, more arthritis in my hands. Uh, you know, I, I can open the bottle, I can close the darn thing up, I don't have to do it. And I never understood anyway why anyone would create a package uh, that made, made it almost impossible for the consumer to get into with a, with a, uh, with a uh, cork puller and all of that kind of stuff. So it, it, it is kind of the future, so we're going to see more and more of that. And because the science of it is so fantastic that it's great. Okay, I'm told I only have a couple of more minutes here. So what do I want to share with you? Uh, I want to share with you... Oh, I think this is, a, this is an interesting one, and I'll do it very quickly. Is sulfites and why? Uh, it's a question that comes up all of the time, and there are many aspects to that. One of the concerns is sulfites and wine are what cause wine headaches. Do any of you get wine headaches here? Does anybody get a wine headache? Uh, so we've dug into or looked at Har uh, Harvard uh, as really, the uh, School of Public Health, has really dug into it a lot. And uh, at first they thought it was sulfites, and then they thought it was histamines, and then they thought it was this. But as it turns out, uh, nobody knows why we do this, because some people get wine headaches from white wine, some people get it from red wine. Some get it from sweet wine. Uh, there just doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason. And part of that is that wine is a very complex beverage. And so probably it's very much more a something that uh, it, it's a very individual thing. So it's not that. And sulfites in wine, sulfur is used, if you don't know. Sulfur is used in wine to help preserve it and help, uh, help kill off any things that might cause the wine to spoil. Sulfites are naturally occurring in all wines. Wine cannot be made without having some degree of sulfite in it. Sulfur is all over Mother Earth and all of that. And so the sulfites in wine are a byproduct of the fermentation process. So even if you made wine and didn't add any sulfites to it, and again, sulfites are added to uh, extend the longevity of the wine and also keep it from spoiling, even if you didn't add any, there would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 parts per million uh, in the wine. Winemakers uh, often will add to that because as a, as a way of preserving the wine. Uh, law, the law in the United States is that you can have no more than 350 parts per million of sulfur, sulfites in the wine, which is really a lot. Most wines that you encounter in the marketplace today are about 100 or so. It's not, it's not more than that. And winemakers are constantly trying to uh, use as little sulfur as they can, but it's kind of essential to make sure, making sure that you have a stable wine. Uh, but it's, it's a, fascinating, a fascinating thing. What triggered all of this was, I think it was back in the mid-'80s, was that there was, uh, I, I, don't, I can't remember now what country it came from, but somebody sent over here, I think it was Austrians, actually, it was Austrian wine, in which the wine, it was on the edge of spoiling, so they put a lot of sulfites in it. And what happened was that it triggered uh, asthmatic reactions in a significant percentage of the population, because they were so high, uh, that the government said, well, you have to now, with wines, you have to put on there that their wines have sulfites in them. Well, all wine has sulfites in them. And the, the part of that story that I really love, for, for those of you who may, who may know him, Dan Berger, who's a wonderful wine writer, has been around for a long time, he dug into it and he made the comment, if you eat one dried apple, one little, little dried apple, you get as much sulfite in that one little dried apple as you get in four bottles of wine. <laughs> and yet the dried fruit people don't have to put on their label that it contains sulfite. So, it's, it's kind of a goofy thing. And so why is that? I have no idea. It's the way our government operates. But uh, I'll leave it there and sort of say, call your congressman and sort of say, let's make sure that everything that has sulfites in it uh, is properly labeled. So that's the deal. Yes, Kim. Hi there. <laughs> How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm Very good. good. So do you have some questions? So do you have yes. questions, any of you? Yeah. You spoke of the uh, shape of wine glasses. What about the glass itself? Yes, good, good question. Uh, yeah, because a lot of glasses, because of clarity and all of that, were made with lead in them. And, you know, my feeling of some very, very expensive wine glasses usually are made with lead because it makes them look really beautiful. The feeling seems to be is just avoid them. Just don't, if they contain lead, why take the chance, you know, to do that? So that's the deal. How do you know? Uh, it has to be labeled uh, in there. So, uh, 
and we're assuming people are being honest with that, but there's a law out there that if it contains lead, it must be, it must be labeled that way in America. Yes? You mentioned in your Earth to Table book mm -hmm. that if you had just one meal to eat, your last meal, oh. What was that? Uh, oh, yeah. So I was just wondering how, how would you prepare that? Which wine would you have with it? And what, what would you have in addition on the plate? Uh, I'd probably just have the salmon. Oh, okay. And so, uh, and I, no what? Uh, uh, no, no, if you have really great fresh salmon, it's okay. great. And so I would have, I'd do it on the grill, uh -huh. number one, that's smokiness, and I'd have a great glass of Sonoma Couture Pinot Noir. <laughs> <laughs> It's really good. And that's that old adage, you know, about uh, white wine with yeah, fish and chicken and yes. red wine with red meats. Yeah. And it doesn't work at all because, to your point, it's how you sauce it and, and prepare it that makes the difference. But, Thank you. Yeah. And you don't sauce it, you just scrape Well, that's how, that's how I like it. Yeah. But, but there's some wonderful sauces. So if you were going to sauce it a little bit, maybe make a little compound butter. Do you know what those are? So butter that you've beaten in some sautéed shallots and chives and things like that, let that just melt gently over the top, and it's like, mm, no. <laughs> really good. All right, so I'm going to read some questions that were sent in by viewers at home. First one that we have is, if I'm at a restaurant and I think the wine is bad, should I send it back? What should I say? Take this wine back. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there, you, I, so it's, it's a really good question. We Americans, I think we are. We're some of the politest, nicest people on earth. We don't want to create problems. We don't want to be, you know, do anything. So often we'll suffer through things. How many of you have sat at a table with a meal that you don't particularly like, and the waiter comes around and says, How are you enjoying it? Are you enjoying everything there? Say, oh yeah, it's fine, it's fine. It's like, and then you turn to your uh, your partner and sort of say, God, this is terrible. You know, <laughs> I should send it back. So the answer to that is. If the wine is corked, remember I talked about corked. If you if you get if it's flawed in any way, uh, or oxidized or something like that, send it back. Yeah, absolutely, send it back. If they have a, a professional there, a sommelier, uh, ask them to do that. And they they'll certainly identify that. But even if it, you just don't like the wine, uh, send it back. You've, you're spending a lot of money. I hate to tell you what the markup is that uh, many restaurants charge on wines, but it's like three or four times the, uh, the cost of the wine. So they have built in, into their wine programs, they built in there the, the accommodation for those odd times in which someone just doesn't like the wine. And it's a real test of the restaurant, I think, to, uh, to just own up to it and say, well, you didn't like it, let me see if I can find you something you do like. Often it's why, and it's the times have changed, and I think all of you have probably experienced this too, that now many restaurants offer many wines by the glass, and they'll bring you a taste of anything, you know, in there. They may not open a special bottle for you that they're not offering by the glass, but that, that doesn't matter so much anymore because they, they are offering wines by the glass that you can taste and make up your mind. But, you know, we're the customer, damn it. Uh, we should get what we want, you know. All right, so the next question is, what do you think about organic wines? And that kind of plays into another one of these questions. What is biodynamic wine? So you may be able to answer both of those. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I'll try. So organic wines, uh, there is an organic standard in America, which you probably know it's a big, if you ever see it, it's about 1,000 pages long that covers. Anything that is labeled organic in America now must meet uh, certain criteria. So in, in the case of vineyards that are, that, uh, or the, and they have to be certified by some certifying body. It has to come in and check to make sure that uh, you aren't using pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and all of that kind of stuff. So it's kind of an expensive thing to do. A lot of people grow grapes organically, but they never go for certification just because of the rigmarole of, uh, of keeping track and keeping records and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's a good thing to do. Uh, one of the, the things generally that uh, we like about organic grape growing uh, is the preservation of the ecology of all of the bugs and all of the other things that are out there. We're not wiping uh, everything out, which I think is, a, which is kind of an important thing. The whole biodynamic thing, and let me say one other thing about organic and biodynamic, is 
some of the greatest wines in the world have been made organically and or biodynamically uh, for decades, if not hundreds of years. So some of the very greatest names in Burgundy and Bordeaux, this is just a way of life for them. They have, they have just done it. And they're not so hung up with putting the organic standard, organic stamp on it. Also, what happened in America, for those of you old enough to remember, is that there were a bunch of hippies up in this part of the world up here. I don't know if there were hippies, but they were, uh, they were colorful people who uh, decided that they were going to make organic wine. And so they made it, and they labeled it as organic wine. Unfortunately, it wasn't very good. And so it gave the whole organic wine segment a kind of bad name. And people who tried it sort of said, Ugh, I'm not going to go after it. I'm not going to buy any more of that organic wine. Well, it's not that way anymore. And again, many producers who do not label their wines organic here in California uh, also, some of the biggest names imaginable are doing it that way. Biodynamic, I'll try and do it very quickly, is the next level. So it's organic plus two or plus three. It was a, an idea developed by Rudolf Steiner Rudolf in, back in the 1920s in which he wrote in a series of things. He was a big global thinker about all kinds of things. He was the guy who started the Waldorf School movement. Uh, so really very, you know, very celestial kind of person. And it has many principles that go, that go along with it that make a great deal of sense. If you grow something biodynamically, you, don't, you can't bring in anything from the outside. So you can't bring in fertilizers. You can't do, everything must come from the property. There's this whole idea of this is a living kind of entity here, and we don't want to screw it up by uh, introducing foreign things into it. There are a lot of woo-woo things about it. Uh, in, it, which includes, and I won't go deeply into it, the burying of the cow horn that's filled with a certain preparation that you'd bury in the spring and dig up in the fall and blah, blah, blah. And people thought, oh, that's, that's just too out there. Uh, but as it turns out, it's based upon, like all of our, um, for many of us, our parents and grandparents and maybe great-grandparents, did things like pay attention to the moon phases, pay attention to all kinds of things that are pretty woo-woo too. Uh, but they work. For whatever reason, they work. So that there, there are things we don't know, even though we think we know everything sometimes. Uh, so there is something to this cosmic energy and all of that kind of stuff. So if you want to read about it, there are some really good uh, uh, online you can read about it. Uh, look up Rudolf Steiner and, and biodynamics. and Quite an amazing thing. The other thing I really love, if you go to a biodynamic uh, ranch or farm or something like that. They're using natural ways to deal with bugs and all that stuff. And one of the very coolest ones is they have chickens, but it's a moving chicken house you know, that they move around. And so the chickens are eating the bugs in the field, and then they move it again. Then, but they leave behind their droppings, which fertilizes. the. So it's this kind of uh, self-fulfilling uh, kind of prophecy. Michael Pollan wrote about it in, uh, uh, Oh, it was it not the Botany of Desire? But one of his books. Anyway, it was about. We talked about, and this is another great thing to look up if you want to see more about that, because it's very much in vogue today. Polyface Ranch uh, is uh, the founder of that ranch. Was the guy who really developed a lot of these things in which everything fed everything. You know, so that's great. Yeah. So I think we can take some more from the studio audience. But would you mind repeating the question so that our yeah. viewers at yeah. home can hear? Along the same topic of biodynamics, are sustainable wineries equal to biodynamic, or is that a smaller level? Uh, so his question was, uh, so the term sustainable and biodynamics, are they similar or are they the same? They're really different. So when we say sustainable, there is no standard for sustainable. There's nobody certifying you as... Uh, so it's a term that's kind of used... Well, it's a term that was used, like organic was used for a long time. There was. You could say it was organic, but who knew, you know, that kind of stuff. But I think when you say sustainable, you're talking about something in which you're paying attention to uh, preserving, you know, whatever it is. What I, we use, I'm, I'm big in the fishing industry, and so we're talking a lot now about sustainable fisheries and all of that stuff, making sure that we're not overfishing them, making sure we're protecting their habitats and things like that. And it's the same thing if you're doing that on land, too. The, the important thing, if anybody drops one of these terms on you, uh, is, is to do what you just did, is to ask the question and say, what do you mean by sustainable? 
uh, give me the, the sense. And when you can look somebody in the eye and say that it's a, it's a different thing than reading a, a brochure or something like that. So does that answer? Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yes? Ah, her question was, what's the story behind these super heavy wine bottles? The heavier it is, the more it costs. <laughs> you know, so, so it gives you. Uh, well, sometimes it's carried to an extreme. It kind of goes back to this idea that, uh, uh, especially big reds and things like that, that you wanted to have something that was sturdy enough to protect it, to, to keep, keep it from breaking. But then I think we got into this, uh, you know, I hate to say it in this way, but it's true, it's a kind of male thing, you know. Uh, the, uh, the bigger it is, the better it is, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, it's kind of silly, you know, in a way, because mostly what it does, once you get past the point of having a structurally uh, safe container, why? <laughs> why do that? Sometimes I don't realize it's heavy bottles so heavy. Yeah. Realize, yeah, oh, no, no. And it's also the, this idea of the, of the heavy bottle. There is a cachet in that, that it, it feels like it's more important <coughs> somehow. And, all of that stuff. So, and we are, like it or not, we are psychologically driven <laughs> by wines that we buy. The, the work that's done, on, for example, on both the shape and the weight of the bottle and label, color, and all of that kind of stuff, it's amazing how, how we're seduced by that stuff. <laughs> One of our online viewers would like to know, should I store wine standing up or on its side? Well, that's a darn good question. So if it's cork finished, like this one is, got a cork in it, then you want to put it on its side because you want to keep the cork moist so that it keeps it uh, expanded and so it, it forms a good seal. If you set this up this way, even with the capsule, this covering that's on there, what's going to happen to it eventually is the cork's going to dry out and then more oxygen than you want is going to get into the wine. It's going to live a shorter life, turn to vinegar quick, more quickly and all of that stuff. The screw cap, oh, here's one here. It doesn't matter. You can put it on your side, upside down, straight up. You know, uh, it, it doesn't make any difference because the, uh, the, if you, if, when you see it on the inside of it, it looks like, doesn't look like anything, but these are, this is what's on the inside of that cap. And these are so, they're so amazing, the work that they do. I showed you that little chart uh, with these things. They form the most wonderful seals and all of that stuff. So the great thing about screw cap is you store whatever is most convenient. You don't have to worry about storing it on its side Fantastic. or upside down. Okay. Yes. The screw cap is proving to be more effective and better. Yeah. Why isn't everybody doing it? Is it a cost factor? Uh, it's it's not a cost factor actually. Uh, it turns out that it's a it, depending upon which of these. There are many. There are several screw cap manufacturers now. Depending on who you use and you know what your special needs are in terms of this stuff, it's actually a little cheaper than getting good corks because the problem is to get good corks you have to spend more money to get those. I think you asked the perfect question and I don't understand it either. <laughs> I don't understand why we don't do that. But there is this idea among many people and I bet there's at least one of you here who uh, I know old timers, I shouldn't say that because I'm an old timer now, uh, but they talk about the romance of the cork, yeah. the pulling of the cork, and you hear that wonderful pop and all that. And it is romantic because usually it means, wow, we're celebrating a special occasion, we're doing something, and that just sort of sets you up and you're, you begin to salivate and do all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but if, if that's all you're getting from the cork, then I'd rather just <laughs> unscrew it and make sure that the line is fine. So, having said that, one of the really cute things, there was a guy, I think it was a sommelier in San Francisco, as uh, screw caps have become more popular, uh, you know, because sommeliers love to come to the table and with great uh, pomp and circumstance pull the cork and you know, do all this kind of stuff. Well, there's a song, and I've tried, and I can't do it, I can't do it, what he did, but what he would do is that he would take the screw cap and he would loosen it a little bit, and then he would come to the table with his towel over his arm and take the bottle and go Psh, like this, and this cap would fly up in the air. He would grab it out of the air and then present it to you. And, oh, like I said. So that's something for us all to work on. And so that'll bring the romance of the screw cap, we'll, we'll call that. Which would be great. And that question, again, I'm sorry, was basically with the value of the screw cap, why is it that not everyone is taking advantage of that? And some people are sticking yeah. to the corks. Okay. Yes. Oh, back to storing. Um, store, is 
Oh, it's a really good question. So our question was, storing wine, should it be stored in the dark? And the answer is yes, always. Uh, start, I mean, as dark as you can do it. There is, some wines are especially sensitive to light. I mean, if, if they're in light a little bit, it probably doesn't matter. Uh, but the French especially have done a lot in Champagne uh, with this. And they found that with both incandescent and fluorescent lights, if sparkling wines and sweet wines are exposed long enough to those things, they actually will go off. And I love the term. The French call it the goût de lumière, the illness of light. And what it does is it, it actually develops, not always, but often will develop, uh, develops uh, hydrogen sulfite, you know, rotten egg kind of things. And you get a little bit of that in there and all that stuff. And it's simply because the wine was exposed to light, which also says that if you're going to buy wine from a wine shop or from a restaurant, you never want to see it being stored, you know, up in a window or anywhere near light for any period of time because even white wines. White wines are even more susceptible to it sometimes because they will, and the tip off is color's a little funny, you know, they will actually begin to change color before it really affects flavor, but once it begins to change color, then it's oxidized and it, it, it begins to do that. So at home, I tell people, I mean, I know people today have fancy schmancy wine rooms and all of that kind of stuff. I tell people, just store the wine in the, in the case, the cardboard case that it came in, because it both acts as insulation uh, and also make sure that it stays, uh, stays dark. And a quick word about uh, temperature, if you're going to start. So I always love this thing. I'll, I'll share this with you very quickly. Uh, what's the average amount of time between, in America, and this study's been done many times, between when a bottle of wine is purchased and when it's consumed in most homes? Let's say average amount of time. <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah, three hours or something because you go down and buy it. It, it's no more than a week. Uh, you know, we, we typically in America, most of us, and I think even less so, uh, don't, we don't buy a lot of wine that we store for a long time. Unless you belong to the Sonoma Couture Wine Club, <laughs> and of course you're buying three or four or five cases of the delicious Pinot Noir that you want to put aside. That's true. Uh, but some people do do this. And so what you want to do if you're going to buy wine that you're putting away for a while that you want to enjoy over you know, a year or two or something like that is to start in the dark. And the most important thing that you can do is make sure that the temperature that it is started, it's not the absolute temperature uh, so much as it is that it's not cycling. It's not 58 degrees now and 78 degrees and it's going like this. It's that cycling, the changing of temperature that causes the wine to prematurely age and go off. So even if you start it at 70, if it's a constant 70 degrees, kind of ideal temperature is about you know, 58, 60, something like that. But even if you start it at 70, 72, and it was a constant one, that's better than having it go like this. And absolutely, store it in the dark. And don't, don't handle it too much. Don't, font, don't take it out and fondle it. You know? <laughs> So we have time for one more question okay. from our online audience. And this question is, what key aspect do you look for when you're purchasing wine glasses? Oh, uh, I, I, so I'm just going to talk about it. So the question was about the key aspect in purchasing wine glass. Something that looks cool, you know, because you want to you be cool <laughs> when you do it. But I, I think I touched on it, and it's, it's about balance. It is about that it feels good in your hand. And that leads me to this idea about uh, stemless glasses, uh, yeah. Yeah. which I, I like for the most part. I find I don't br break as many of them. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. The stem doesn't get broken. The only thing I don't like about the stemless glass is that uh, typically I'm eating barbecue or something like that. And so you have greasy, <laughs> greasy prints on it. And the other, the other more important reason is the heat of your hand uh, tends to warm the wine, can warm the wine a little bit faster or something like that. But I think they're I think they're good. I think they're good. So so it's something that feels good to you and you already know no rolled edge, a, a decent base and all of that kind of stuff. So that's right. what I look for. Well that closes out our question portion. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kim. Okay, well we're so glad you came. Was this fun? Would you yeah. ever would you ever come to another one of these? Yeah. So let's see. Uh,
Well, you might, uh, you might think about what you'd like, like to cover. We've talked about doing uh, food and wine, you know, about mm -hmm. cooking with wine. Maybe we could uh, bounce some things off of and bounce wines off of some foods and also figure out how to make them better, you know, sometimes, yeah. because that, that's always the big challenge. The story that I'll tell you very quickly about that, and this is my encouragement to you when you're cooking, is uh, it goes back, it harkens back to, uh, I actually got to spend a lot of time with her when she was uh, alive, was with Julia. And so I would help her with her presentations and stuff like that. And uh, I can remember in the, in the very early, I met her in the, in the early 70s, and she would get questions, at, if you remember any of those shows, she often would be drinking wine, you know, while she was cooking and all that kind of stuff. And people would ask her, well, why are you drinking wine, Julia, while you are cooking? And of course, she would answer in that wonderful, high-pitched, throaty voice of hers, well, it's because I love wine and all of that stuff. But then she would often add to that, that the wine that she was sipping on was the wine that she was going to serve with the dish. And so she was tasting it and adjusting the wine, ad adjusting the food to make it work better with the wine. And so the takeaway there is if there's one thing for you to think about when you are serving wine and food together, is to make sure, and this was Julia, this is Julia talking, not me. She would say, make sure that the food is in acid balance with the wine, that, it, that, that they had similar acidity which means that in almost all instances, you need to add some acid to the food. Whether that acid is citrus, whether it's vinegar, whether it's the wine itself in there, in almost all instances, food needs a little bit more acid uh, than you, you might think. And when you do that, almost it's, it's the most amazing thing. A little squeeze of lemon or something in there, and it's like suddenly they may not have been working so well together. Suddenly they're... <sighs> They're working really well and balancing off of each other. So when you're cooking at home, drink wine while you're cooking. Drink the wine that you're going to be serving with the dish. And then think about balancing acidity. And that's, that's the big part of it. It can help us. Yes, yeah. So that's, that's a principle also. Her, her comment was about, does it make the dish less heavy? And, and the answer is yes, it does. Uh, it, uh, it, it, just, it just lightens it, you know, and depending on the wine that you're serving with. But if just think about that. It doesn't matter what the color of the wine is or any of that kind of stuff. Just make sure that the acids are in balance. And it's, it's a magical thing. And then you too can be Julia. And you, yes. can, you can be Dan Aykroyd and, and uh, pr practice your imitations of her, which would be great. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.